Hello and welcome, Steve, to the Biohacker Babes. Thanks for joining us today. Well, you're very welcome and thank you for inviting me. Yes, we've been planning this one for a while. I'm so excited to bring the topic of silver to our audience because as I was saying right before we hit record, I think we've kind of dripped out some information to our audience about different uses of silver, but we've never dedicated a whole episode all about the history of it, the different uses, maybe even some of the controversy around it. So we're going to do a full breakdown for everyone. And you are the expert. So we're so grateful to have you on to talk about that today. So I think to kick it off, I'm curious, you know, silver has been around for a very long time, right? There's some evidence that uh, what stood out to me was that the Romans were using it to store their wine um, in these silver urns. I think that's pretty interesting, but it's been around for a long time, but how did you personally get so interested in the topic of silver? Uh, well, it happened oh, a long time ago, and back in uh, probably 97, 98, um, my neighbor's company, he, he owned a mining company, and they mined precious metals, and that kind of tanked out for them around that same time period, uh, and so they kind of developed this little miracle particle, this unique particle, uh, just almost by happenstance. And uh, they found out that it had value and with many applications. And so they started to produce it and started to put it in several types of uh, applications. And, and uh, so being the neighbor, uh, I'm a science guy. I'm a science nerd. I'm actually a retired teacher. Of course, retirement for teachers means we go from three jobs to two jobs. And so he was <laughs> pestering me constantly to get retired. And so I could go to work for him and be their scientist. And uh, so I finally made that jump about seven or eight years ago and retired from education partially. I still teach at the university level and, uh, and joined their company full time. Awesome. Well, thank Amazing. you to your neighbors. <laughs> I'm really yes. grateful for that. Yes. So what was it about silver specifically that kind of grabbed your interest so much? Well, when they first started, they created a wound gel. And uh, I had kind of, I had an old alley cat. And he was always getting in fights and, you know, always coming with scrapes <laughs> and cuts, you know, how cats can be. And so one time he had a great big scab on the top of his head. And I'm going, oh, dear. So I washed it off and, and I saw the hole and the hole was about the size of a pencil. And so I looked in there and I could see his skull. And I'm going, uh-oh, this is not going to end well for this cat. So I asked the neighbor, I says, let me try some of that gel. And so I squirted it in the hole. And kind of the fur puffed up and I'm going, okay, we'll see what happens here. <laughs> a week later, the wound was healed and he was just fine. And so I'm going, oh, this stuff really works. Didn't have to go to the bed or anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So awesome. This this is such funny timing. So I was actually just gone over the weekend and I have two cats, um, a two-year-old and an 11-year-old. And funny enough, they like to wrestle and it's like very playful wrestling. But when I came home Sunday night, I noticed my older cat had a little scratch on his forehead so I started putting the silver on there the past couple of days and it's healing up really nicely. Yeah. So, yeah. Those are some cool. lucky cats. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I so have put some care. silver on my dog before and didn't think twice. I think for both of us, Renee and I have never really thought twice about using silver because we grew up with our dad, who's a biological dentist. And this was just in our house. Oh. It was just so commonplace. But I realized that it's not commonplace in a lot of households and a lot of people have this thing about silver that we've been taught or conditioned to believe is maybe not so true. So can we get into some of the myths around silver? And the one that comes to mind, of course, and maybe comes to a lot of minds is the blue man. If you, if you have too much silver, you're going to turn blue and bad things are going to happen. Well, it turns out that's probably true, but it depends on the type of silver. That's really the key of this whole this whole thing is the type of silver. Uh, there are silvers out there that uh, some people make in their garages and at home, and and it's just it's it's not good for you. It really isn't. Most of those silvers are what we call ionic silvers, and a silver ion is just a single silver atom that's lost an electron, carries a plus one charge in the chemistry world. So with that in mind, if you start taking that type of silver, it doesn't really clear out of the body very well. And so it can, with high doses, build up in the body. And it turns out the body kind of stores it in the adipose tissue in the dermal layers of the skin. When the sun hits it, it oxidizes just like a photographic film and it turns gray to blue. So that type of silver is not very good for you. Now, it turns out that condition is called argyria. 
in Algeria, it's, it's a condition. It's not a disease. It's not a, you know, it really causes no harm, but it doesn't look very good when you're walking down the street and you're this blue gray person. Unless now the it's blue Halloween man, or, you know, yeah, it's true. some yeah. funky celebration. <laughs> yeah. And, and the blue man, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's documented what he did. He took massive doses of silver over an extended period of time. And that's what he ended up with was Algeria. Um, but the only effect was, is that, you know, turn you blue. Uh, silver by itself is, is not toxic. You have to would consume a, a massive amount of silver for it to be toxic anyway. But our silver particle is very unique in that. It's a very patented process where we've been able to create these small silver particles and these particles are between five and 15 nanometers. Now don't get upset about the word nano because there's this big thing about nano going around. Nano just means small. And uh, so, you know, these very small silver particles, it's a solid silver core, solid silver metal core, but on the outside of it, we've been able to create something amazing with what we call a silver oxide layer that's bound to the surface of that silver particle. And that's the key for its uh, ability to be antimicrobial. Mm. And can you share a little bit more about the parts per million? Because it seems like there's, you know, debate about that too. So what, what are we looking for, for that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I saw a part of a uh, product on the internet the other day that was 20,000 parts per million. And I'm going, oh my heavens. And they had a picture of it and it was this dark brown, gray uh, liquid. Um, that's way too much silver. We've been able to do head-to-head -head studies with a lot of different silvers out there with our little silver particle that we actually perform better they, than they perform with head-to-head -head studies against bacteria, yeast, and molds with 10 parts per million. And so what we found out though, is we says, well, what if we start you know, dosing it up and getting these parts per million higher and higher? What we found out was, is that the kill rates are faster for those pathogens, but once you get above that, 50 parts per million range, it actually it starts becoming cytotoxic for your probiotics. Not for your cells, but for your probiotics. And so we can do what everybody else does with these lower parts per million and not affect the probiotics in the body. Mm. So interesting. Yeah. That, I just think there's so much myth around that and misconception. You walk into a natural food store and the shelves are aligned and I think similar to probiotics, we were taught more is better. And suddenly the count right. just keeps going up, up, Absolutely. Up. <laughs> like, it's just... and, and you think you're getting better bang for your buck by by grabbing the one that has, you know, the highest bacterial count, the highest nanoparticle count. So I, I'm just so fascinated with this particular technology. Can you explain, can you take us into the body and, and explain how the technology is going into the body? Almost like a video game. I want to know exactly what where it's going, what it's doing, what is it communicating? Yeah, on our label, we have well, we have uh, several series of products. We have an immune support product that you take internally. We have wound care that you put on topical wounds, and we have some cosmetics as well. So uh, we can kind of go over each one in, independently. But the uh, the immune support, uh, the label is one teaspoon three times a day. That's kind of you know the the standard label. Uh, so what happens? You go ahead and put it in your mouth, and what we'd like to say is to keep it in your mouth for as long as you possibly can because it absorbs through the mucosa parts of the body. And so that's the mouth, the esophagus, all the way down to the stomach. That's where it's best absorbed. And it absorbs very quickly. You know that some medications you put under your tongue like nitroglycerin and things like that, uh, that's the, where you're supposed to have it absorbed. Well, our silver is very similar to that. So once it gets into the mucosa, it wanders around you know, through the bloodstream at this point and does what it's supposed to do. Now, our immune support, let me go ahead and kind of explain what I mean by that. We all have pathogenic bioloads in our body. These are bacteria, yeast, and molds that exist in actually everybody's bloodstream to a very small extent, but it's not causing disease because our immune system is trying to take care of them on those low levels before it gets out of hand. Well, our immune support takes care of that bioload. So your immune system is more efficient. It does what it's supposed to do a lot more efficiently if it's not trying to take care of that bioload. And that's how we support the immune system. Hmm. So as far as the immune system, so you briefly mentioned that it doesn't harm the probiotics when it's below 50. 
Is it similar with like the immune function? Because I know sometimes you don't want to boost the immune system so much that it's an overdrive. So does it kind of keep it in the middle of functioning? Yeah. Yeah. What it does, it doesn't boost the immune system. It just allows the immune system to be 100% efficient instead of going overboard, you know, like it's now supercharged. It just lets the immune system do what it's normally supposed to do at the levels that it's supposed to do it at. So the immune system's not stressed. Mm, got it. And because it's also not antibiotic resistant, which is a big oh, yeah. problem. That's a on... huge thing now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've got these really bad bugs. You have MRSA and VRE and all those really things that have become antibiotic resistant. Uh, we just did some testing on one of our, our cream products. Uh, we just got the results back with MRSA. It inhibits the growth right away. Um, so uh, wow. with, and it doesn't have any known antibiotic resistance whatsoever to any bacterium yeast or mold. Are, are hospitals using this? We actually have our wound care product. It's a 510K. That's a fancy FDA term uh, as a medical device for our wound gels. And they are using them in hospitals uh, here locally in the Wasatch Front. That's amazing. Because I, I mean, I keep hearing about the antibiotic resistant bacteria it's just gonna take over hospitals so um i hope that we see more of this yeah, yeah would this yeah, be that's... a good way to reset that can we kind of level the immune system in that way and <laughs> well the the antibodies well the, you know the problem is is that the uh, uh the antibiotic resistance is already there and so there are MRSA bacteria in hospitals right now and unless you would burn down the hospital and start over again, you're not going to get rid of those bacteria that are already in the hospitals. And, uh, you know, once upon a time, I was in the medical industry for a period of time, found out I didn't like sick people, so I left. <laughs> but anyway, uh, those, you know, those bacteria are there and uh, you can get infected in hospitals, unfortunately. Um, and so is it resistant to antibiotics that are already present? Yes. Is it resistant to silver? No, not at all. Silver will inhibit the growth of those antibiotic resistant organisms. Mm. So what is the best use of the silver as a preventative or as a defense or somewhere in between? I mean, historically it was used kind of as a preservative, but were our ancestors consuming this regularly or is it just best when we are up against excess invaders, foreign pathogens, a toxic load. Well, yeah, one of the, one of the adages, the historical adages I, I see all the time and I use all the time is that, you know, that, that person was born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And that was directly probably to the royals and the lords and, you know, those types of people that have silverware and silver utensils. And so by eating it, they were getting kind of a daily dose of silver and according, you know, if you compare that to the peasants who were ate off of wood, they were much a healthier population for sure and had longer lives. Wow. Interesting. But we probably shouldn't yeah. be walking around just putting metals in our mouth, correct? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a much safer way to do it now, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I don't know why this just clicked in my head, but um, so Lauren and I were, were sisters and I remember Growing up, we both had these silver spoons with our birthday and time on them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's like a connection there. I don't know if that was like a thing. That that would be an interesting uh, dive into history to find out because, yeah, there's a lot of that's out there. It is quite a bit. Yeah. These little silver spoons. Huh. Oh, can we, can we dial in mom and before. dad and find out? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mom and dad, if you're listening, can you find those silver spoons and tell us more about it? <laughs> yes. Okay, it's very so, traditional though. Yeah. That's yeah. so fascinating. So beyond the silver spoons, when should someone use this? Are, are we wanting to prevent or again, is it best used in the winter time when immune system is down, you know, less vitamin D absorption? You know, I, what you were saying was to me was all the above, you know, you can use it every day for immune support. And uh, the, the nice thing about our particle, we have studies, human ingestion studies that we know for a fact that our silver clears out of the body between 36 and 72 hours, where other silver products like the ionic silvers I was talking about, they don't. And so our silver goes into the body, does what it's supposed to do, and then leaves. And so you can use it every day without any worries about, you know, the silver building up in the body. So yes, you can use it 
prophylactically, you know, to just in case. Um, I travel abroad. I have a weird hobby. I'm an international bobsled and skeleton official. One yes. of my hobbies. I love so, that. That's awesome. <laughs> I saw that in your bio. Yeah. And, and so I travel all over the world. They fly me all over the world to do races. I pack silver everywhere I go. If I meet at a questionable restaurant, I may put a little bit more in my system just to be sure. Uh, absolutely. Mm. And if you're feeling ill, uh, yeah, again, it's an immune support. It takes care of that bio load so the body can do what it's supposed to do. Hmm. Yeah, I've definitely experienced that is if I feel run down and I am really diligent about taking my silver, I don't get sick and I feel great. So yeah. pretty powerful stuff. Um, since our parents are in the dental field, I am curious about the dental component because there are a lot of people using these really harsh toothpaste and mouthwashes that are just wiping out all the bacteria in the mouth, right? Good and bad. So it makes sense that silver would be good in toothpaste for the role that it can play. So can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I saw a Listerine um, ad on TV last night and they're swishing their mouth and they're going, you can feel that I'm going, yeah, that alcohol's burning your tissues and it's not oh, good for no. you. I'm going, yeah. oh my heavens. Uh, but yeah. silver, yes, we, we've, we've done, done the testing with, with uh, oral you know, uh, types of organisms, you know, plaque organisms and biofilm organisms, and it does cut through the biofilm. It's able to remove the biofilm and get at the organisms, the silver is. And so not only does it you know, kill bacteria, but it also takes care of biofilms as well. And, uh, you know, some, I, uh, well, a couple of years ago, it was, well, heavens, about four or five years ago, we put our toothpaste together. And so I started brushing with it. It was my formulation. I really like it. So I started brushing with it. Well, I started going to the dentist. I go to the dentist every six months and about, oh, probably a year into it. He says, what are, what are you doing? And he says, your, your pockets. And I know he's talking about periodontal pockets. He says, your pockets are healed and you don't, bleed as much anymore when I clean your teeth and I'm going, well, I'm using this toothpaste. And so I explained it to him and he goes, oh, and he says, that's that's smart. Can I have some? And I said, sure. So that, you know, that's one. Uh, We have another dentist that we can talk about here locally that actually uses the silver Mm -hmm. uh, in extractions. And what he does, he's definitely off label, but he's a doctor, so he can do what he wants to do. He mixes the silver with the bone matrix and puts that into that open pocket uh, and closes it. And it turns out that it builds better bone back because it doesn't have the bacteria outgassing that without it. And so he's able to put implants in in a better better way than than normally would. Yeah, actually, I know that our dad does that as well. That's interesting to say it's off label. Yeah, he he takes like a little syringe and he'll just shoot some silver into the extraction site. So that's cool Mm -hmm. to hear that other dentists are using that. Yeah. Powerful. So is there a mouthwash coming down the road or should we just be using the regular like immune silver and swishing it around? Well, I've been playing around with some things for sure. And it looks like they have something on the schedule. I didn't know they even scheduled it for possibly an August launch uh, on a mouthwash. Oh, that's exciting. That is very exciting. Cause I think, you know, it's so easy to just really crave that clean alcohol feeling in your mouth, but it's just, it, it's damaging so much goodness that we could have in our oral mucosa and, and our oral immune uh, system. So anything sure. else you want to say about commercial mouthwashes, like a little PSA to the, to our audience? <laughs> I would just, and, 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 you know, I, I rinse with silver. Um, I, uh, I use silver toothpaste and, uh, uh, you know, you don't need that burning, nasty feeling to, to get your mouth clean. It's not necessary. The silver does a great job without any of those side effects, I guess you could call them. Yeah. Killing off of, you know, the good bacteria that we actually want for a healthy oral. Bio. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I love and- the toothpaste. I, it's so crazy growing up in a family of dentists we've tried all the toothpaste and there's just something else about this toothpaste that it's almost indescribable because it's well, not some... that go ahead one one of the other products we have is actually a tooth gel i don't know if you're familiar with that or not but it's I have basically tooth gel but i haven't experimented much with it tell us more so yeah um the tooth gel is basically our wound care gel with peppermint and xylitol 
And so a lot of people have been trying that out. And what they've done is they brush their teeth with a toothpaste and then they basically kind of brush with the tooth gel and don't rinse before night. And they wake up with their teeth all squeaky clean and just fine. So that's kind of one way that they've been applying with the tooth gel. The reason why the tooth gel was put together in the first place is one of our, uh, one of our board members who's old, um, he's a great, <laughs> great scientist. And, uh, but, but over the years, he's been using these heavy abrasive toothpaste and it's made his teeth really sensitive by basically scraping away all of the enamel. So he needed something without an abrasiveness. And so we created this tooth gel with no abrasives and that's what he's using it for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes more sense. I, I was just brushing with the tooth gel, like in replacement mm-hmm. of my toothpaste once a day. Um, it di- didn't feel as good as the toothpaste. So that, that makes sense. It's a little bit. It's a different, different mouthfeel, isn't it? Yeah. Different mouthfeel. Yeah. So I'm going to try that. So you can just put it on, I guess, maybe before bed and then just go to sleep yeah. with it. And just leave it. Don't rinse. Yeah. Okay. And so same that. as the other products, you could use it every single day. No issue. Is there diminishing returns at a certain point where maybe you just don't need it and you could save product for another time? That's a good question. Um, I just use it every day just just to take care i haven't had a cavity in years and years and years so you know for my oral health yeah i just use it every day great yeah all right (laughs) i know i'm sold it's it's really my favorite toothpaste on the market because as lauren was saying we've tried all these different toothpaste and it's so hard to find one that doesn't have toxic ingredients and tastes good and still works it's so hard but silver biotics has finally done it so Thank you. Yeah, I think a lot of us have been there with the natural toothpaste. You're like, is it clean? Doesn't feel so clean. I feel like I I need to go chew some gum now, which is probably not the solution. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, excellent. What about the skincare? So how is this, it could be a preservative, correct? If we're looking historically at how it was used, how did that come to be? How did you realize that that actually could be protective and and preservative? Well, the wound care, uh, we have wound care gels and we also have uh, cosmetic creams. And it has basically, again, all the same silver in there. And uh, like I said, our, our wound care, we actually have a wound care version uh, that's a little stronger. It's a 32 ppm, but it is FDA cleared as a medical device. And again, uh, what, makes, what makes healing possible with a wound? You have to close the epidermis. And so the problem is, is you get bacteria, fungus molds in there, and it's, uh, it's basically cytotoxic to those very fragile skin cells that are trying to migrate across the wound bed in order to close the wound and heal and to build up, you know, the layers of, of, of stratum. So again, our wound care gel, it takes care of that bio load. And so those very fragile skin cells are able to migrate across the wound a lot faster than they normally would without it to close that wound a lot faster. And of course that takes care of the scarring as well. It cuts down on scarring because you know, a scar, basically a wound is a race. Who's going to win the race, the epidermal cells or the dermal cells? If the dermal cells win, you have a scar. If the epidermal cells win, you don't have a scar. And so if you can let those cells be healthy and happy and, and uh, heal quicker, minimize the scarring and, and close the wound quicker. I love that analogy. So yeah. what about perfectly healthy skin or we'll say normal skin? Normal skin, healthy skin. Uh, yeah, again, um, the uh, uh, all of our products, you know, have um, basically uh, I can't really call them claims, but they are for skin irritations as well. So we're talking about first, second degree burns, sunburns, abrasions, uh, all kinds of skin irritations uh, is what they're designed for. And those skin irritations, the reason why usually the skin is irritated, unless of course it's an autoimmune system like that. But those irritations get worse because once the skin is opened, they're open for infection as well. And so our products, again, take care of that bio load on the skin so the skin can be healthy. Yeah. Mm. And if someone seemingly doesn't have any irritations, you know, normal to oily combo skin, are we still preserving the good bacteria on the skin? Are we affecting collagen in any way? We are, again, as long as you're underneath that, that threshold, that, that, that concentration, you're, the probiotics of the skin are just left un, untouched and they're just fine. Um, a lot of the, you know, we have Staphylococcus aureus all over our skin because it's a natural flora. But mm-hmm. left unchecked, you know, it's an opportunistic infection. You can cause infections from that as well. 
so, you know, along those lines, yeah, the, uh, uh, well, and for an example, if you were to put like the, the gel on your hands and the gel dries or put one of the creams on your hands and it dries, well, the silver is still there. And so if a bacterium happens to run into those silver particles, even though it's on your skin uh, and you've applied it to your skin, it's still going to kill the, uh, the organism, the pathogen. So, you know, it can be a protectant on your skin as well. Hmm, beautiful. Yeah, I've actually been using the skin cream on my hands, especially through the winter in Vegas. My mm-hmm. skin gets so dry, it's terrible. Yeah. It's like snake skin. But what I do is I'll load up my hands with the cream and then I actually put like organic cotton gloves on top when I sleep. Mm-hmm. And it yeah. has been saving Ooh. my hands through the winter. Why have yeah, you been we hiding made sure this that biohack we... from me? Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't live in the desert. You don't need to do it. <laughs> yeah, but I have all those little, you know, little tears by the nails where the skin splits because it's dry. And oh, yeah. I've been using the skin cream as well at home, but I'm traveling. And I've noticed in the last month, because I haven't had it with me, my skin now is falling apart. But it was doing really well while I was using it before. Yeah, yeah we, we made hack. sure that, that, yeah, we made sure that the skin cream has very organic and clean ingredients because that's kind of the world that we want to live in as well. We don't need all those preservatives and all those chemicals in there, the parabens, the sorbates, the benzoates. We don't need any of that because silver acts as a preservative as well. So why aren't more skincare companies using silver as a preservative? Is it it more expensive? No, it's not more expensive. It's just what they're used to. And again, Uh guess our, our lovely regulatory body you know, those three letters, uh, they have accepted the benzoates, the, the parabens and all that as preservatives. And so that's what the industry standard is, unfortunately. Mm. So hopefully as people start to spend their dollars in other ways, maybe they will eventually phase those toxic ingredients out. Hopefully. I would certainly hope so. Okay. Yeah. I'm so curious. Why would they hesitate to embrace that if it is another solution it's not wildly expensive well again that regulatory body we've been talking about still does not like silver they still treat it as one of those heavy metals and you know this whole thing about heavy metals it's you know unfortunately we live in a world right now where if somebody says something and if they say it enough times it must be true and silver being a heavy metal uh, and associating it with those toxic heavy metals like cadmium and lead and arsenic and those really toxic ones uh, is just crazy because silver is not toxic at all in the human body. Um, And, you know, we can say that because we know for a fact that silver is never part of any of our metabolic pathways in the body whatsoever. It's never used. It's never taken into any of our metabolic pathways. And so uh, to say it's toxic, uh, it's, it's a misnomer because it's not associated, it shouldn't be associated with those toxic heavy metals that do get into our metabolism and cause serious problems. Mm. Do you think it's yeah. that they're just not testing the silver sold or testing the other silvers that are getting stuck in the body? Are they just not testing the right stuff? Because certainly if they are not looking at the right technologies, yeah, I could see where that could easily go down the wrong path and we could all be confused. Right. You know, and, and again, uh, the FDA is very careful uh, to support certain companies that produce certain things. Sure. And uh, if they were to actually do the testing and come up with the real value to, of silver, uh, it might harm these big pharma companies. And so we've been very careful over the years not to get involved with big pharma because wise (laughs) they eat companies yeah yeah very Mm. wise (laughs) yeah i just spent the weekend actually at a mastermind and really interesting diverse group of people i mean we had physicians there we had people that work with big pharma um, lobbyists people that work with health insurance companies and just hearing the different perspectives of how to approach things and how you have to be so careful when you have a supplement company you say one wrong thing and that's the end. You have to be so careful. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, during the past couple of years, the FDA and we've, uh, we've have, we have audits with the FDA. They actually love us. They come to see us all the time because they bring their new people to us because we have all of our things taken care of. All of our uh, paperwork and documentation is just perfect. 
And so the FDA actually likes to bring their newbies in to kind of train and say, hey, this is what you're really trying to look for and these mistakes. Uh, but with that in mind, um, uh, it's, it's been interesting to us that um, the FDA is okay with silver. It's, you know, we, we're, they're fine with what we've done so far, but they're not, really, they're not willing to say that silver is quote unquote safe and effective are the magic words. They're not, in, they're not going to call it what we call grass, generally uh, related to safe. Mm. So they're not willing to do that yet, but hopefully in the future, they will come around to that and uh, silver will be out there in the spotlight uh, and as it should be. Yeah. Yeah. If you could look into the future, 10, 20 years, do you, do you think that this miracle particle will, will just be commonplace for everyone? Or do you think it kind of will stay in this special category of people that want to lean into more and more the bacteria. Right information? <laughs> more and more bacteria are becoming resistant to the antibiotics that are out there. And we'll I have think no that's choice, probably, we won't have a choice. Yeah. Essentially we won't have a choice. Mm. Yeah. And silver has become really popular in the biohacking community too. Um, curious. Do, do you have any thoughts as to why biohackers seem to be gravitating are, towards it? I, I love biohackers because they, they look and they research and they, they you know, they experiment and they're finding out that silver is okay. So it's about education, you know, and again, I'm a retired educator, you know, for, you know, for me to, you know, be on a podcast, I just put on my teaching hat and, and teach because that's what I like to do. I like to teach people about their health and their wellness. And so biohackers, they're that group that really understands and looks for facts and looks for knowledge. Yes. Thank you yeah. for saying that. Well, you are a great awesome. educator. Yeah, I'm. Well, thank you. Yeah, we appreciate you sharing everything. Yeah, Sorry, Lauren, I'm so. Oh no, I was just gonna say curiosity. Then I was gonna say curiosity killed the cat, but if you have silver, it's gonna be okay. It saves the cat. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a terrible okay. saying. <laughs> yeah, I'm so curious. The answer could very likely be no, but is there any crossover with your work in silver and the bobsled and skeleton work? Are you like secretly infiltrating that world with your silver <laughs> miracles? Well, um, I, I mean, I have a long history. In 1997, they built the track here in Park City getting ready for the games. Uh -huh. And so I was, I actually started sliding skeleton myself when I found out I was too old and too slow for the games, but I still kept sliding. And so my kids were uh, also uh, national athletes as well. And uh, of course, when you're sliding down the track at 80 miles an hour and you hit walls uh, of concrete and ice and things like that, you're going to have some owies. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would always have silver with me, <clears throat> excuse me, and hand it out to athletes that had bumps and bruises and abrasions. And, and so, yeah, that's, I, I kind of supply that, I supply those products to that, that sport. Yeah, that's great. I wanted to be the sponsor of the American skeleton team. Like, why isn't it already? <laughs> yeah, of everyone. And I'm curious about one other use for silver. What about uh, na like a nasal spray or through like the nasal passages, especially the with only, the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. And under the label, under regulations, we can only apply it to the mucosas of the mouth and the esophagus and the gastrointestinal system. Again. Oh. We've had a lot of people use it off label with great results. I mean, we've had over millions and millions of bottles of immune supplement and wound care and everything sold. Not one complaint to anybody, including us, and anybody is the FDA or any adverse reaction has ever been reported anywhere. And you know that people have used it in places that, well, we can't really say to use it in. I have it. certainly put it up my nose many, many times. Is there just not enough literature to support it? What is the resistance? <clears throat> uh, the resistance is the uh, is the FDA again. It's just they say um, if you put it in other places, it has to be a drug. And so, in mm -hmm. order for silver to mm -hmm. become a drug, we have to put in what they call an NDA, which is a new drug application. Pharma does that all the time. But on the average, to get an NDA through and put it through the, the FDA is about 20 to $40 million. Oof. 
That's wow. too. So all of these drugs you see advertised every night, you know, I saw one for a key true to the other day or stuff like that. Um, the big pharmas are spending millions and millions of dollars to get that on the market. And millions then making, and then making billions and billions. And then making billions trillions. and billions. Exactly. <laughs> and so yeah. that's the problem is that if you put it where you're not supposed to put it, according to the FDA, you're actually a drug and they will come chain your doors and say, you can't do that anymore because you're using it as a drug. Hmm. Okay. Could silver even be classified as a drug because it's something that's, I mean, it seems so natural. It could be, but nobody has ever taken the time and the effort and the money yeah. to send it through the process to get it recognized as a drug. What we've been able to do is we've been able to get re recognized through the FDA as a medical device for wound care. And so we actually have uh, now a 510K wound spray, which basically our 10 ppm immune support, has a wound spray that's cleared by the FDA for wound care. That's amazing. So do you believe there is anywhere you can put silver that would be harmful? Not to my knowledge. Again, we've had no uh, complaints or adverse reactions in any way over the period of, well, since 1997 until now. I love to hear that because I, I love to use it in different places. You know, I'll open up the bottle, put some in my mouth, and I've been known to just put some up here. And <laughs> You can imagine what people have used it for, and they've been very successful with it. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. <laughs> awesome. A anything else we should know about silver? Oh, actually, I do have one more question. Specific question. Colloidal silver. Oh. That term yeah. is thrown around a lot. A lot. Yes, unfortunately. Um, okay, most, I would say over probably half of the products out there that say they're colloidal silver are not colloids. They're ionic. And again, ionic silver are those single silver atoms missing an electron. A colloid is a particle and particles ranging from five nanometers up to, by the, by the formal definition, up to 100 nanometers in size. And those particles are permanently suspended in a solvent, in this case, water for us. That is the true definition of a colloid. So when you're looking at silver products, well, and there's some silver products out there that say, if you can't see it, it's not there. It has to be colored. Well, it turns out that those silver particles are actually very, very large. And so you can actually see them. They're usually a brown or a gray type of a, a you know, a solution. Whereas ours is colorless because our particles are small enough. You can't see them. And so that's kind of the difference right there. So true colloids are not ionic. They're particles. And that's what makes ours a true colloidal silver. Okay. So why would products be labeled as such if they're not? What's the purpose? Are the <clears throat> tradition companies just confused? It's tradition. It is just simply tradition. And they just tradition. think consumers will never question it. They don't know the difference. Exactly. I, mean, I certainly didn't know the difference. I, I'm sure that 10, 15 years ago, I was just reaching for the colloidal silver. That's what was on the shelf. It looked the best. Exactly. You know, fancy yep. brought it with the blue and the silver. It looked good. <laughs> yes. They got me. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The market out there, I just call it the wild, wild west. And it's I mean, such as so many things. I think that's it happened is. to CBD. I think you see it in many different places mm -hmm. where people get yeah. excited about a molecule, a compound. And I think, I think they want to help. They want to share the wealth in that yeah. regard, but obviously missing a few key points of information. Absolutely. So yeah. for someone that's interested in Silver Soul, how, uh, tell us more about your company, <laughs> I guess is the question. Well, you can reach us, it. yeah, you can reach us at silver at uh, silverbiotics.com. And uh, we have Instagram as well uh, at silverbiotics. And so you can, you know, reach us there. We have websites uh, on there with literature, with test results, with all kinds of information to educate people about uh, silver biotics and our silver particles. Great. Yeah. We'll link to all of that in the show notes for today. So people can check it out. I will say the resources on the website are awesome. I'm always going through and reading the latest and greatest. So appreciate that.
Me too. Well, My favorite welcome. page is about all of the historical uses. I'm like, it was used for that. It was used for that. I feel like you create a storybook of the history of silver. It's just so fascinating. Yeah, so absolutely. lots for our audience to dig into. So Steve, before we let you go, we want to ask one final question. If you could give our mm -hmm. audience a final piece of advice, something they can do to biohack or optimize their health, wellness, life, anything you want to share today? Well, I, I'm in the business. And so uh, you, the use of silver is, is long known. Our silver is safe. It's very good. To, it's good for you on many, many levels. And so, uh, again, uh, biohacking to me mm -hmm. is, is about a, a lot of educated people searching for health and wellness. And uh, you guys have done a great job with sharing that with, with everybody else. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for helping us to do that. You're yes. very welcome. No. So next time I get a question, is silver safe? Can I use silver? Should I use silver? Now I can just send them to this episode. So absolutely. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, our friend Steve said so. And we, that's all we need to know. Yes. Well, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for spending your time with us today. And thank you to everyone that tuned in. We will see you next time.